Welcome back to the After Hours Entrepreneur. Mark here. Today, we're speaking with Alex B. Sheridan. He's a video marketing strategist, has his own company, and there's a few really, really good things you want to listen to today. So first off, we're going to start talking about his move from employee to employer. What is it like going from being paid to paying yourself? Alex is going to walk you through how he made that leap. We're going to be talking about green screens, how to properly use them, how to not embarrass yourself. You definitely want to listen up if you've been thinking about green screens. And lastly, we're going to be talking about edutainment style videos, what that really means, and the three layers of edutainment videos. Listen up. Let's go. Run the tape. What is up, After Hours Entrepreneurs? Today, we are joined by a video marketing strategist and someone who's really taken on this theme of edutainment and his coaching program and his done for you services program. Listen, we're going to get into all the nuts and bolts about edutainment and how video marketing can transform your business, but who better to do it than Mr. Alex B. Sheridan. Alex, what up? What's up, bro? How's it going? Not much. It's good to see you. It's good to see you in video form. I'm so used to seeing you on LinkedIn and I, I've, you know, I want to talk about this a little bit in a, in a few minutes, go into more detail, but I've noticed here over the past six months, 12 months, you've really started ramping up the creativity, the production level of your LinkedIn video. So I'm excited to chat about that with you today. For sure. Yeah. Noticing it, but I want to go back. I want to go back in a time. Listen, this is the after hours entrepreneur, right? That's this podcast. So let me just ask you point blank. One question. I'm just gonna give you a layup question that I already know the answer to is, is your video marketing services. Is this a, a side hustle or is this your main income source? No, it's, it's the main income. All right. So you've made the leap. You've made the leap yes. from, uh, from employee to employer to creator. Walk me back to that. What was that moment like where you decided you're going to quit your job? Oh man, it was a, it was a, I remember the night before I put in my two week notice. It was, this was July, 2020. So a little over a year ago. And, um, you're in the middle of the pandemic. I, it, yeah. In the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's when I kind of started my business right before the pandemic. And then the pandemic happened and then my business really took off because people needed more video. They needed to do more digital type of things, more marketing content. And so we kind of took off, but, um, July, 2020. Yeah, it was, it, it was, just, it kind of was half like, man, kind of nervous and a little bit scared because it's a big leap. I have two daughters too. And so it's not like I'm some 20 year old living in my basement, my parents' basement where I could just, you know, goof off. I really had a lot of responsibilities. And so, um, I, I thought long and hard about it. Wanted to make sure I was set up for success, but I was part, yeah, nervous, a little bit scared, uh, but also really excited, man. Also so confident in what I was doing and the results I was getting from my clients and the future of video and content marketing and LinkedIn. And I just had, I just knew that this was what the way it was going. And I also had confidence enough in myself to say, look, you've gotten this far through hard work, through high levels of service, through having a great brand that people can be a part of and continue that work hard. You're talented enough. You'll work hard enough and you care enough that whatever problems that come your way, you'll, you'll figure out a way around them or through them. Yeah. I like that. And especially I'm a father of two, too. I got a five-year-old and a two-year-old and, and a, a spouse. So, you know, making that jump is, is it's a little scary. I'm thinking we're going to, it's going to happen for me pretty soon. I'm still an after hours entrepreneur myself. I think I'll always be, but that is the dream. I think of after hours entrepreneurs to, to build that infrastructure, to build that system, and then to take the leap and go all in. I'm also curious the day that you, you, you officially left the employment, the employee job and started working on the video marketing business. What happened over the next two weeks after you made that leap? Oh, my, my, everything that went, could have went wrong, went wrong. <laughs> uh, I mean, no, it wasn't. I was hoping, it was, by the way, I was hoping you were going to say, oh, it was great. I went all in. Everything was going smoothly. It was awesome. No, honestly, you know, no, things went well. I mean, honestly, things went well, but I did have my computer like crap down on me and I had some other issues. <laughs> I had to buy a new computer and I'm like, of course this happens like the day, the couple days later after I quit. Um, it was good. Honestly, um, I was, again, very confident in what we were building and how I was servicing my clients in the future of what I thought content marketing and video was going to be. So uh, nothing crazy happened after that two weeks. I had a couple, you know, like the computer went out and a couple things where I was just like, oh man, of course, the timing of this. But yeah, it was business as usual for the most part. I was, I think the biggest challenge I had was now I had more time and freedom throughout my day. So yeah, the first couple of weeks, I like, I didn't use my time as efficiently as I could have. I was so used to cramming things in you know, very early in the morning after hours till midnight. Cause I had my daytime job where I had a lot of responsibilities and I had, yeah. I was, had employees that were working under me. And so I think just figuring out how do I spend my time and what do I do with all this extra time now during the day? That was probably the biggest challenge. 
Did you find, so this is an interesting point, Alex, and I think one of the reasons why people stay employees is because it's pretty obvious what you need to do. I go to work and I do what my boss tells me, but this is, a, yeah. I think, a, a challenge that I think about myself. I've been an employee my whole life, but that free time, you get up in the morning, there's nothing on your calendar. What do you do for the next four hours? Do you, do you find yourself getting, did you find yourself getting distracted or did you have to put systems in place to make sure that you actually stayed productive? Yeah, that's the toughest part about entrepreneurship or one of the toughest parts is that you've got, it's one of the most, it's, it's kind of the best thing about it is that you've got a hundred percent freedom in the direction that you go, the choices that you make, but it's also one of the biggest challenges because you, yeah. you, you have to make every <laughs> single decision and it's all on you. There is no mm. like, you know what, let's do this, let's do this. So that's what's so challenging because you can, go, if you take a wrong direction and go there for three months, that could really set you back. If you take the right direction, it could set you up. And so that's always been the biggest challenge is that it's hundred percent on you and you have that freedom, which can be a blessing or a curse at times. But um, yeah, time management, I did have to put some processes in place to time blocks for sure. My morning routine really didn't change. I always still wake up to this day. I've been doing this for over two years now. Um, the first thing I do when I get up after I kind of talk to myself for a little bit is, um, I go straight to the coffee shop at 6 AM. I'm there every single morning at 6 AM and I'm getting in my creative space for about 30 to 45 to, to 60 minutes every single morning. I'm either writing scripts or getting content together or getting in my creative space, writing music, whatever it is. And, uh, that's always been a big part of how I start every single day. I love for me, it, it's, you know, unleash the creative. I'm just fueled by it. And I, it, it's my brand. It's who I am. And it's how I stay kind of creatively sharp as well. Brilliant. So I want to, I want to go a little bit deeper into this unleash the creative, because that's why I brought you on to, to talk about what you're doing, how you're doing it. But why don't, why don't you just give us a little bit of context? Cause there's a lot of uh, video coaches and strategists out there. Give me a little bit of context about what you do at unleash the creative, Alex. Well, Unleash the Creative is our, our tagline for, for really the brand and the movement that we've created. Um, Impacts Marketing is our company. But, you know, we're trying to inspire and create a world where pe people feel inspired and uh, empowered to unleash their natural creativity, the, the, the potential that they have inside. Everyone has gifts, talents, stories, messages that they want to share with the world. And unfortunately, 99.9% .9 of people are just not doing that. And that could be you know, real life hurdles, it could be insecurities, it could be they don't know, understand how the strategies. So we kind of help people put that together. And, and in the beginning, it was a lot of coaching, training, consulting. And we pivoted this year into more done for you. I still do some of the coaching, training, consulting, but um, I wouldn't consider myself a coach nowadays, I would consider myself more of the CEO and, and founder of impacts marketing, where we've okay. got, you know, we're a team of 12 now. And so I've got a team lead, and we've got video editors. And so for for me, it's become even more so about how I use my time. Where do I spend my time to make the most impact? Who can I hire? How can I delegate? What can we automate? You know, because your time just keeps going like this and this and this right. keeps crunching down and getting your window gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Even the meetings that you take, you have to be more strategic with that. So, um, so we help people create, you know, people can, our customers can sit down with us. Let's say it's a business owner, for example, small to medium sized company. They can sit down with us. They're busy, right? They, they want to create content, video, get themselves on video, but it's like, how? And I don't have the time and the resources and I don't have an editing team. So we'll sit down with the client, let's say for one hour, once a month, and we'll turn that into 36 videos on, you know, 12 original videos and then reformat to two other formats. So they can post 36 different videos on, you know, three or four different platforms and really get their message out, get their story and their brand out, start attracting their dream clients and build a brand in the process. And they really only have to show up for one hour, once a month. Brilliant, brilliant. So because I think this is a thing that really gets people stopped. They, they, they're going all the way, I want to do video, I want to do video. And then they they're about to hit record. And they're like, I don't know what the heck to do. I don't know what to yes. do. So so what I'm telling you is you kind of what I'm hearing you is you kind of develop like a, a virtual studio. Right? So but maybe you're using Riverside like we are now or zoom or we something are. like that. Yep. You're using Riverside, they join you in the studio, you kind of coach them through a recording session. And then you you edit it into great content from there. Correct. We just had a session before this call and it was just brilliant. I mean, the, the client has um, a soft kind of a software system or software product that where they help calculate the ROI of, of sales teams and things and deals. Right. And they really help that customer journey that buying experience and they help them close more deals. And he, he just hadn't had any content that really I got to tap into this, just these gold nuggets and these freaking this wisdom that he's had for decades being in the industry and stuff. And it was just like all coming out in this session. And I'm like, I'm thinking in my head, I feel like I just tapped into like a gold mine here. And I'm like, this is just brilliant stuff. And so 
that just reaffirms that unleash the creative. It doesn't necessarily mean you're doing some ultra creative edutainment video, but it's, you've just got these stories and these messages and this value that you can provide to the world. But yeah, a lot of people do need help getting that out, whether it's a time thing, whether it's a, I just don't know how to do it or what to say, or I'm feeling insecure about it, whatever it is, we help them through that process, both coaching and actually doing the post-production work for them and getting it ready to post. Good stuff. Cause and it's funny that you're doing that. Cause I've started doing that with some of my clients as well. Just like one to two hour recording sessions, then we'll handle all the back end. And it's, it's also really helpful too, for simple stuff like proper mic usage, lighting, yeah, taking pauses, looking at the the lens, some of the, the stuff that I think creators, you know, that more experienced creators take for granted. Right. Yeah. So I, I could definitely see the value there. I want to talk a little bit though, I'm kind of going to get to the nuts and bolts because one of the things I like to bring people on for is to answer my questions and tweak, uh, uh, you know, handle my curiosity. One of the things that I've been very remiss to do is implement a green screen into my productions, right? Uh, because I think I've seen, well, let's just say a couple green screen productions go wrong. You've taken the other stance pretty recently. You started getting on the green screen train. Tell me, green screens, overrated or underrated? Oh, underrated. Underrated. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I actually started first started using a green screen uh, two years ago. So I've been using them for quite some time. Now, when I first started using them, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And so there were a lot of those wrong type of green yes. screens, you know, those, those bad takes and stuff. <laughs> but once I figured it out, um, it is very powerful. Now, the thing that I'll say is that with our clients, we can record on a session like this to Riverside and we can still remove your background and place you anywhere through our editing. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to have it, but if you've got a green screen, it gives you so much more creative freedom because you now can place yourself anywhere in the world and you can add different elements in and different characters in. And so from a creative standpoint, do you need a green screen as a, as a creator? No, you don't. But if you're trying to do really creative type videos, does it help and give you a lot more options? Absolutely. All right. So let's talk about the execution a little bit, because I think that the, if there's one thing that nobody wants, it's to look stupid online. None of us want that. And co pretty commonly when I'm seeing green screens, like you're seeing like all these fuzzings in the background <laughs> or you're seeing like weird folds in, in the in the uh, the green blanket or whatever's behind. What can we actually do so that we look good on a green screen, Alex, please? Well, some of the stuff you're seeing are probably virtual backgrounds, which are just like they're not very well mm -hmm. done this day and age. And so they're kind of choppy. But from a green screen perspective, you know, if you go to Amazon, if you type in fold up, fold down, collapsible green screen, you'll see that there's green screens. They're probably the exact one that I have where you can fold up and down. So it's nice for storage, but also it doesn't wrinkle. So you don't have to yep. like tape it up or like hold it up or iron it out. And I've used that same green screen now for Honestly, I think it's close to two years. I think I pretty wow. much had this one since day one. And, now, is it like uh, a paper or is it like a cardboard? Is it a material? It, yeah, it's a, it's a good cloth material, right? And it okay. folds up and folds down with the kind of the plastic contraption. And so it's sturdy. I mean, I've used, I don't even know how many videos I've made, dude, over 100 for sure um, through that same green screen. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. My setup, I'm actually going to do a YouTube video, uh, called how to create your own green screen studio for less than 300 bucks or 350 yes. or whatever it is, because it's not expensive. I have cheap lights. They were like 39 bucks on Amazon. There are two lights on the side. I have a cheap ring light that just went out on me. And then I have a Logitech camera, which I think is a hundred something bucks and then a Yeti mic. And so there's nothing fancy about it. People always thought there was some kind of fancy studio. It's really nice. Just knowing what to do with the equipment that you have is the yeah. most important part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So super simple. We'll get a, and I'll put up a link to a, a fold down like Alex is talking about, uh, by the way, you can, I'll put a link to the YouTube channel as well, where Alex is actually going to show you in real life how to do it. Um, so let's, let's talk, let's, let's say that, okay, I've, I've invested 300 bucks. I got my green screen. I got my lighting. Let's get creative. Let's unleash the creative. In fact, let's unleash the creative here with, uh, by the way, we're talking to Alex Sheridan, if, if not, if you don't already know. So anyway, we're ready to unleash the creative. Our green screen is up. What's a good way to actually get started? Should I just record myself drinking a pina colada on the beach? Are people going to care? Like, what should I even, like, what are some ways I can get my juices flowing on this green screen? Where should I put myself on the Eiffel Tower, the White House? What do you think? Yeah, so the first thing you want to think about is what's the, the message or the uh, story or what do you want to convey to the audience? You know, how do you, what do you want to teach them? How do you want to inspire them? What do you, how do you want to make them feel? And I always try to build each creative video that I do around a message. So I'm thinking about what do my clients struggle with? What are their challenges? You know, maybe they don't understand how to make videos. So I'm going to build a message around that. Maybe they're unsure of what equipment to use. So I'm going to build a video that's creative around that. 
So I always think about how can you make this valuable? Because to me, that's edutainment versus entertainment. Entertainment could be getting on there and doing something silly to make someone laugh. But does it tie back into your brand? Does it tie back into your business? And that's always what I've done is I've always been very intentional about, yeah, it's creative and it might be funny. It might make you laugh. It might make you think, wow, that was really, I've never seen something like that before. But there was always a clear path back to my business, back to the brand in most cases, right? And so think about that as you build your, your creative green screen video out. I would also say that, you know, it's important if you're going to get consistent with creating creative videos and using something like a green screen, and you're going to script out that type of video, like this stuff is different because you can get on it's interview style, you can chop it up and talk, and then you, you take clips from it, right? Yep. But if you're going to script out a video and you're trying to be creative, you, you got to create that creative space for yourself. Like for me, it's in the mornings, like you can't expect to just sit behind the green screen and be like, all right, I hope something amazing hits me right this second. No, you got to put in the work. Like I, I get up, as I mentioned, every single morning, 6 a.m. to 6.45 to 7 sometimes, and I'm just writing things out, concepts, scripts, creative ideas, my next few videos, you know, like I, I'm spending time. So it's like, I think people look at it sometimes and say, you must just get up on there on the green screen and you got <laughs> these ideas and you just kind of record them. And I'm like, it's so much more than, it would be like looking at like, you know, uh, not to compare myself, but to be looking, looking at Kobe Bryant on game day and he's nailing these shots and doing these cool stuff. And you're like, you must just get on the court and like magic happens, right? It's like, hell no, man. I'm putting in practice. I'm putting in work. I'm, I'm why people are sleeping. I'm writing scripts, man. So yeah, it is a skill that you have to build. Some people do have natural gifts, right? You might be great on camera. You may be great at telling stories, humor, interviewing, whatever it is, but you've got the opportunity as a human being and as a creator to elevate those skills and those strengths and turn them from maybe an average creator to an amazing creator because you've leveraged the things that you're naturally good at and you've put in the work to build the skills. Okay. So there's a lot of really good points here, Alex. One of the, so one of the things that you said that I, that I think really resonates with me is understanding your brain and the brain goes through different phases throughout the day, right? At certain points of the day, it's like, it's really sharp. It's quantitative, ready to do analytics. Other parts of the day, it's you're in the creative phase. And then other parts of the day, it's like, I just want to go to sleep because I'm dead. I just, you, you, you worked me too hard today, boss, right? So I just think, Hey, that's really important. I find, and I think knowing when your creative space happens during the day is important as well, because like you said, Alex, you're actually, you've actually identified when your creative brain space is happening and say, this is the time that I'm going to start writing out my script, right? So just th walk me through a little bit of what that script writing process looks like for you. Are you just saying hook three body, po body points in conclusion? Like how scripted should we be? Give me a little bit of feel behind what you're doing. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at my next, you know, six weeks worth of content and uh, not that I'm going to, not that I'm going to get out every single post for the next six weeks. That doesn't happen. But I do look at my edutainment or creative videos for the next six weeks. So I'm looking at like, all right, if it's six weeks from now, do I have all six slots filled up with concepts that I can turn into a script? Certainly this week's done, next week's done, the following week's probably in production. But beyond that, do I have the idea? It starts with an idea and a concept. Similar to, you know, if you're going to make a movie, right? You'd say, well, I, got, I need a plot. I need something to go off of. Like I need a premise. Like where does it take place? Is it World War II? Is it right now? Is it in the future? What's the storyline? What's the plot kind of going to be centered around? And then I can start incorporating the characters, right? I can start bringing in different elements to the actual story to start scripting it. So then it's like, it, I call it a skeleton, but I kind of build out a skeleton. Once I got a concept, right? Then I, I build out a skeleton, which the skeleton of the script is just the beginning kind of the middle with the storyline and plot, and then how I think it's probably going to end. Once mm -hmm. I have that, then I can actually go through and like script it line for line. So, okay. cause sometimes the beginning is like important. You got to catch their attention. You got to bring people on a story. It's got to make sense. So you can't go too crazy with it. You got to, people got to understand where you're taking them. And then the middle is kind of like, what's the story? Like, where are we going with this? What's the value that the audience is going to get out of this? What are they going to take away from this? And then the ending is kind of like, where do I see this going? And sometimes the ending changes. There's a twist or something I didn't see coming when I first started scripting it that I saw towards the end of it. So that's kind of how I set it up. Okay. Okay. And yeah. So let's, let's, let's go a little bit further here, right? Because you're very active on LinkedIn. So I want to talk a little bit about LinkedIn. That's one of your main hubs for acquiring clients, uh, taking these video marketing videos, reaching people and converting into clients. One of the things that I've noticed in, on occasion when I bring on new uh, clients of my own, is they'll have a large following on social media. LinkedIn in particular, I find this to be common. I had a client the other day, he's got like 20,000 LinkedIn followers. And when he would post something, he'd get zero likes. 
like literal crickets, like just nothing. And this is a common thing. And I'm wondering to myself, you know, should I just go in and just delete, a, like, should we just remove a bunch of connections because he's being, you know, we're just delivering to the wrong crowd. Like, what are your thoughts on that? On people with LinkedIn, that have these large followings that get zero engagement. Yeah, it, it's, it does happen a lot. I mean, and to me, it comes down to two things and really one core thing. How did the audience get built in the first place? Yeah. Right. So it's almost like if you, if you built this audience, but it's, it came over the last decade of you just randomly connecting with people and people connecting and you just kind of built it. And there wasn't really much of a, a buzz or a movement or a reason for them to be connected to you and be excited about the content that you're putting out. Then yeah, you've got 20 K thousand, you know, 20,000 followers or 20,000 connections, but none of them are engaged and them know who you are. You haven't been consistent with content. So they're not expecting to see more of your stuff. Versus there were times when I was coming up and I mean, I had zero followers in 2019 and I have over 20, I think around 21,000 now. I built it from scratch. But when I had three or 4,000 followers, I was, I could, you know, there were times when I was like getting more engagement than someone that had 30 because my three or four or 5,000 were, they were bought in, they were engaged. They had seen my content. They, They wanted to follow me, right? So it's how you build that community, that audience. And then to go along with that, it's, are you engaging and actually treating it as a community or are you just posting an article every couple of weeks and hoping that people engage with it? LinkedIn, for sure, uh, different than some maybe like YouTube or TikTok, is that you? it's a platform that's built on engagement. You have to show up. You have to engage with your own content. You have to engage with other people's content. And you want to because you want to get feedback. You want to know what are your ideal clients? What are your target audience? What are they talking about? What questions do they have? How do they react to your content? What other content are they reacting to? What do you see and show up in the, that's a common uh, thread in the comments, you know, and then you can take that and use that to create other content. So you got to study the audience. You got to treat it like a community. You got to study that audience and community, and then you can build upon that. But to me, I think it's how you built something, you know, it's like building a house on a shitty foundation, dude, at some point, like you can't expect that to be a fantastic art. Like it's not going to be the greatest mansion ever when the foundation sucked. Well, that's kind of my, my thought here is like, do we just scrap the whole foundation and rework it or do we just keep building levels on, you know, it's, it's a little rickety. I don't know if you need to go through, to be honest. And and I mean, you know, I've never seen a study on this. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I don't know if you need to go through and scrap all the connections, but I would say that moving forward, I would talk to that person and say, one, we got to get consistent with content. We got to give people a reason to want to follow us, to be excited to see more of our content. We got to engage with other people's content consistently, five to 10 posts a day, let's say. And we got to kind of rebuild it in a way. Do we need to delete all of our old connections? Probably not. But do we need to kind of treat it as a rebuild? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, because I mean, I I guess my thought is, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is why you never sub for sub. You never follow for follow. Don't do it. Because the, the problem, what ends up happening, what we're kind of talking about here, just to give a little more context is, if a social media platform shows your video to someone that's not a fit for you, that's just not part of your, your tribe, the social media platform, they're not going to watch it. And the social platform is going to say, Oh, this is not a good video. And then all of a sudden you've got a bunch of followers that don't care. They've not engaged. And then the social platform just thinks that you're not producing anything valuable. So if I'm hearing you, like, I think my stance on this, Alex, and correct me, correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm off base here is that like you, you don't want to just go through and necessarily scrap everything. My solution was let's be more thoughtful about the tags that we're using, about who we're engaging with via hashtag, or um, again, just tagging an account that I think might be relevant. Um, and then instead of scrapping everything, we'll just let kind of like the the bottom, the bottom kind of yes. filter out and try to, you know, put out the right vibe, right? Yes. And I would use sales navigator for trying to win clients on here and getting their feeds and, and for your content to show up in theirs and your and theirs to show up in yours. Then I would also use something like sales navigator to research and find and target your ideal clients and start engaging with their content in a meaningful way. Well, you, in a meaningful way, you can build lead lists out, like whatever you want to do. And then what you'll notice is you'll start popping up more in their feeds. They'll start seeing more of your content. You'll DM each other. You're having conversations, their content. If they're active, which you can search by people who have posted content in the last 30 days, Target those people because you know they're already active. They're already posting content. Don't target someone that hasn't posted in six months. And then their content will start showing up more in your feed. So, yeah, you got to look at it like a rebuild, even though you're not scrapping everything from from zero. Yeah, but it's implementing the best practice. And this is the reason I think that working with someone that's an expert in the field is helpful because then you get to do, you know, psychographic analysis, keywords. You know, you can look at various KPIs, competitive analysis. You can do a lot more stuff there. 
Man, we've covered a lot. I do want to just kind of touch on edutainment just a moment because we talked a mm -hmm. little bit about edutainment, Alex. And you know, I've got you for a couple more minutes, thank God, because yep. you're, you're you're helping my videos here. But I want to talk about edutainment because this is kind of a mixture of the educational portion, which there's a lot of coaches out there that want to put out okay, educational co content. But you want to keep it interesting so that people are actually going to watch, right? And and it's finding like Patrick Bet David, I think does this pretty good with value tainment. Chris Doe, by the way, is amazing at this. I don't know if you're Chris Doe over there at the future, um, mm -hmm. but he does this. He just does puts on the most entertaining webinars, and not because he's a comic or anything, but he kind of like engages with his audience and kind of makes fun of them a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. And it kind of plays off the right way. Anyway, my question here, Alex, is edutainment. Like, are, do you think that there's different styles? Is there a place where edutainment can go too far? You know, I don't think I'm a good dancer, so I'm not going to be doing these dancing, pointing at things. Like, what do you think here, brother? What's the future of edutainment? What are the different types? Yeah, man, I just did a video on this. So you can check on my YouTube. Um, it, it's what is edutainment? It's, it may not be what you think. And I did it because people really don't have a clear definition of edutainment. It's also just very new, right? <laughs> and so what I did is I pointed out there's kind of three different layers to edutainment. One of them is where the creator really doesn't do much of anything. You can add in sort of that edutainment element through editing or through, like you said, you're pointing up at text and there's music being added. Very simple stuff. Anybody literally can do it. The second layer, which is more of the intermediate layer, is that you're adding in other characters or other elements that you're having to add in as the creator. So, for example, if I'm talking to you right now and, and I'm like, I'm like, Mark, people are making these videos. They're literally putting people to sleep. And then I have the next scene where I'm like falling asleep, like huh? <laughs> what? I'm watching what, you know, like that's edutainment, but very in a simple way where I'm just injecting little things throughout the video, but I'm having to make those adjustments as a creator. And then there's the third style, which is kind of the advanced, which that's what some of the stuff you see with me where I'm literally building out like a mini movie and it's a script and there's multiple characters. There's a start, there's a plot, there's an end. Obviously that's an advanced and that, that does take some experience and skill to be able to do. Um, but you can start off in level one, level two, and then work your way up if you want to. It also depends on who you are as a creator and what, what strengths you have, what you want to leverage. But yeah, there's different levels to it for sure. Edutainment is just simply taking a message and making it a little more entertaining to consume than if you were just were to say it or outward. Well said. And I, uh, by the way, I'm going to have a link to his edutainment pay playlist here on YouTube. So you can check that out. Very creative stuff. Um, I think that one of the things you said, Alex, really hit home with me, and that's understand yourself and mm -hmm. what you enjoy. And I think that, you know, if, if you can be true to yourself and put your own creativity out there, if you unleash it, the creativity like they do over at Impacts Marketing, um, you can't go wrong. You're going to just everyone. You, there's something interesting and unique about you that if you can leverage it is going to be intensely powerful. And I think that we live in this day and age where people are, are, are more likely to hide what makes them unique rather than push, push it out there. And I don't know if you've seen that, but I think that the brands that I find that really pop off are the brand are the, are the owners, the content creators that say, this is me, I'm out there. You know what I mean? A hundred percent, man. That's when we're conditioned very early on. I mean, I think from a, even our, our brain from a, how we're wired is conditioned and how we, how we grow up in our school systems and society is to kind of fit in, to kind of go with the crowd, yeah. to, you know, this is the path you probably need to take. If you're not going to do that, you got to do this. And, you know, there's so many different paths now. There's so many opportunities for people to explore their natural gifts and how to use those in real life scenarios and in business and stuff. And so you got to break through the mold. You got to kind of come out of the matrix a little bit and uh, step into <laughs> who you really are. I mean, I was writing raps and doing storytelling and, since I was 14, but then I got into corporate because I thought that's what I had to do. And I thought I couldn't really touch that side of that creativity side until I unleashed it years later. That's why I'm so passionate about helping people do the same thing now. Love it. Love it. Alex B. Sheridan, ladies and gentlemen, find out, find all the links below. Alex, been a pleasure, brother. Thanks for helping us unleash the creative. Appreciate it, brother. Great chatting with you. Hey, thanks for listening to the After Hours Entrepreneur today. It's time for you to go out and execute your own edutainment style strategy. And by the way, if you want to launch your podcast, if you want to make your podcasting fun and simple again, I've got your back. Head over to MarkSavantMedia.com and I will show you exactly how I can make your podcast production really reach people the right way and sound great and look great and not give you headaches every Sunday night. All right. Thanks for watching the show. We will catch you here next time on the After Hours Entrepreneur. Peace.